Wow, can you believe it? This OMD M1 X here is turning too soon. Having used it almost exclusively for all my professional jobs since launch, I think it is time to conduct my long-term review on this beast. This video also comes at the right time because Olympus just released a brand new firmware over Christmas to include improvements and new features for the first time since its launch. So let's do this. Hang on there, do I sound like someone else? <laughs> oh, never mind. Let's do the Robin way. Let's do this. Welcome to Red35. My name is Jimmy Cheng, a professional photographer and filmmaker. This channel is about sharing my 16 years of pro experience with an aim to help you become better in photography, video making or both, together with gear review to help you get those shots and videos easier. I'm also an Olympus ambassador, so you will see a lot of Olympus gear in this channel too. So smash that subscribe button and put on the bell notification so you won't miss any content from me. Twenty twenty has been a strange year. Many have been affected adversely as a result. For my EM One X, it's been even more of a strange year. I bought this piece here when it first came out to do one thing: location photo shoots. That accounts for eighty percent of my business. I did so in a heartbeat after testing the prototype before launch. It was exactly the professional camera I need to perform regardless of weather conditions. In twenty nineteen, I shot tons, and I mean like loads over 100,000 clicks of photos. I even left my trusty E1 Mark IIs at home and only took them to weddings as my second or spare cameras. E1X was my primary still shooting machine. Due to unprecedented lockdown in UK at the beginning of 2020, I lost most of my jobs overnight. That meant I didn't really use my E1X. At the same time, I also got the new E5 Mark III and E1 Mark III for review. So I've been using them for a bit of home projects and photographing kids at home. My beloved M1 X was left on the shelf, gathering dust. But after a couple of months of adjustment, I finally got back to this channel and started daily streaming. I rediscovered the M1 X and started to use it as my main video production tool. Something that I thought the M1 Mark III would be doing since it's got better facial locks during video mode. Well, at least in theory. Things got more intense after my live stream started to take shape, and the more I used the M1 X, the more I found it to be a video workhorse. In short, in 2020, my king of steals had turned into a king of videos. There you go, after two years of mixed use between photos and videos, I think I can call this a genuine long-term review that is based on intense real-life professional use. I dare to say that any Olympus product is ever poorly made. Well, at least in my case. I have tested all the cameras since 2016 and own a few fair myself. From my tiny LSP4 recorder to my trusty and rugged compact TG6 to the PanF and OMD cameras. Metal or not, all are very well put together with high quality finish. The M1X is an exception. Built like a tank doesn't even come close to describe the ruggedness of this top professional camera. It's more like the indestructible G-Shock watch in the camera world. It's something that, that I can't really word it. You've got to try it to understand. Having said that, I do take care of my equipment and I will try to preempt any potential dangers that could ruin my session with my client or project that I'm in. But still, accident happens and there's nothing you can do to avoid it. My camera got knocked out of my hands a couple of times when kids ran over and bumped into me. I also left my camera on the table when I was packing up and the alcohol soaked group wobbled over and turned the table upside down. Despite all these incidents, apart from a few scratches, my camera survived. In terms of build quality, the M1X is as good as a camera can be made. Full stop. Time and time again, I praise Olympus Color Science. It gives me natural and workable skin tones like no other, and I love it. People often misinterpret Michael Forth as being an inferior platform, but for those who know photography, who appreciate images, know very well that this isn't true. I'm not suggesting Michael Forth beats other formats in terms of image quality, 
but images is more than just about pixel perfect. From base ISO 200 to 800, the E1X is comparable if not better than top end APS-C sensors. In terms of color reproduction, dynamic range, and noise performance, this range is sufficient to most professional photographers, unless you're into paparazzi and scoping people in their bedrooms. Experienced photographers read lights, understand situations. Coupled with Olympus Brilliant 1.2 Pro lenses, I rarely should be on 800, unless I'm in a cave capturing people dancing with one candle. This isn't an excuse, but rather a factual response for my professional experience. Just to give you a reference, I've done nothing different in my job since I switched over to Olympus four years ago from Canon full frame. This was one area that got me into M1X in the first place. At launch, the X was the only Olympus camera that could customize focus groups more than the usual 3x3 or 5x5. And perhaps it was the dual Trupex 8 processor. Everything just felt snappier, faster too. The cool AI subject tracking wasn't a gimmick, it actually worked. But it was something that I never had the chance to use since my main targets are mostly human. So in that regard, I actually prefer the latest E1 Mark III's enhanced portrait mode with better eye and face tracking. But using 3x3 group with face detection on is more than sufficient to get fantastic results for all my portrait shoots. With firmware 2.0, this cool AI feature has received a new additional bird profile on top of planes, cars, and trains. Okay, I'm no bird photographer, but you all know I love my pigeons when I'm in London, and I photograph them a lot. So this could be very good for me, but we're still in the middle of lockdown and I haven't been out to central London for almost a year. So I guess I wouldn't know until the time comes. So for the purpose of testing, I head out to my local lake where there are some birds. So let me show you how it works and how effective it is on these little creatures. Hi guys, I'm bringing you out here to my neighborhood just to see this lake here because I want to demonstrate bird detection with the latest firmware update on the EM1X. Let's crack on. I can't want to, I don't want to waste any time because it's pretty freezing cold out here today. And uh, yeah, let's do this. I'm going to start recording now so you can see exactly what the camera is seeing, right? Okay, so let's see if we can find some bird. So before I do that, let me go to the menu just to make sure that the uh setting is done it's under menu a3 which you can see the subject tracking bird is turned on so that means that we should be able to highlight birds as and when we see some so let's um let's see if we can capture something too that'll be cool right okay bird <laughs> absolutely no bird here today what the heck oh there is something oh there you go there you go can you see that right that is awesome right can you see that just how good it is you don't have to worry about too much uh, in terms of uh, uh, where the bird is as soon as the bird is in the frame once you set it to CAF plus tracking it should highlight it and automatically focus on the bird so you don't have to worry about where your focus group is currently set to or anywhere else doesn't matter as long as it's the, uh, the camera sees it recognizes it locks onto it and that will be it and you can just really focus on trace uh, chasing the bird and also the compositions and and other things you may want to do such as the the, the actual exposure settings like shutter speed and so forth um, not it doesn't really help that I'm actually <laughs> using it on a tripod the only reason I'm doing this is because I want to show you guys the video and uh, if I'm doing handheld it may be just a little bit too shaky it might make you a little bit motion sick right I don't want to do that uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's hard work when there's not many birds flying and they're quite far out and I don't really have a long lens for it. And this is exactly why maybe I should get the 150 to 400 f4.5 Pro. But well, that's too expensive. But if you guys are lucky enough to have that lens or maybe even the 100 to 400, you know, the premium lens, that should be quite cool for like things like this. You know, if you're into birds, uh, like photographing a lot of animals, wildlife, um yeah birds in flight those lenses are perfect for it 40 to 150 don't get me wrong it is awesome it's a very good lens it it just it just doesn't it just doesn't have that that oomph in it because it doesn't doesn't reach far enough to get the birds uh but 
It's good, it's got a general purpose. I love this lens for shooting portraits, right? I told you many times already, it's a very versatile lens and, uh, and it's, it's quite affordable. And the build, look at this, it's a full metal pro, pro lens. It's really awesome. Right, I've got one more duck coming, hopefully. Oh, there you go. There you go, you can see it. That's it. I, you know what I want? I want to demonstrate. I want to demonstrate that uh, uh, one is close enough because another feature that I want to show you is that it will try to lock onto the eye of the, uh, the, the bird. So if it's close enough, it will try to find the eyes on the head, you know, which is, uh, which is quite impressive. So uh, oh, too quickly, that one. Let's see if this one can go quick enough. Let's see. Like, you see what he's trying to do here? He's trying to go for his, his head. See, not the body. If I let go of the shutter, you see he's highlighting the whole bird, but as soon as I half press it, it will try to look for the head. And if it's close enough, it will even try to move, it even try to move to the eye itself. And uh, that is good. That's how impressive this focusing system is. So you may get a bit overwhelmed when there are lots of birds in front of you because you get all these boxes highlighting everything. Oh, that's the problem. So now you can see the bird. They're recognizing the bird, yeah? So that's cool. So now you can see it. So you can, rec you can see the bird, but it would not go past it. Trying to get another shot here. That's a perfect example, look at that. So now there's a bird there, you can see it's highlighting, but it's focusing on the branch, on the tree branch. So it just would not go, it just would not go. Which is a bit disappointing really. Now he's okay. Ah, there you go, that's a perfect jump. There's a perfect jump there from the actual animal to the branch. Um, I'm hoping that this will be fixed in the future and uh, because when you lock on, you really want to lock it on, whether there's going to be something in front of it. Um, one thing could be doing is like, you know, what we used to do for continuous focusing is by delaying the actual change of focus. And uh, so that would sometime help because uh, uh, if the animal is just simply going past something, and uh, then it will not get distracted. But in this case, the system just reacts too quickly and it just jumped from the actual subject to the branch almost instantly as you can see as you can tell from the uh, from the footage there it's unbelievable how quickly it was and which is good in a way that shows that the AF actually really works really well um, but in terms of subject tracking uh, that's a problem because um, uh, if you go past that little branch there and uh, if a bird just flew past some trees just like momentarily just like for that split second and you lose it uh, so hopefully that will be addressed in the future, um, but I can see that this can only get better. Um, I can see that it's really effective, it recognizes the bird so quickly, uh, it locks onto the eyes and the, uh, the head of the bird uh, as and when it recognizes it. Um, yeah, I think it's very, very impressive. Speaking of handling, all E1s has great grips. The E1X is no exception, big and deep. Even my lady-sized hand finds it comfortable to hold. Yes, the X is big, but not much bigger than E1 Mark II or III with vertical grip attached. It also weights about the same too. So if you use vertical grip on your Mark II or Mark III, whether it's for portrait shooting or as a simple enlargement and counterweight for larger and longer lens setup, something like the 300 f4 Pro or the 100 to 400 or even the new 150 to 400 Pro, you will be very happy with the One X. Other things to note is that the E1X is the only Olympus cameras that has two nipple joysticks in both orientations. I found them to be fantastic for both stills and videos. They do speed up operation dramatically, especially if you frequently change your focus points. Like I said in my previous video, the E1X and the E1 Mark III are the only two Olympus cameras that allow you to change focus points on the fly while recording video. This is truly something if you are relying on the awesome continuous AF that Olympus has to offer in video mode. No touchy touchy things on the screen, just look at the EVF or the back screen and tickle those nipples. Fantastic! This is a high-end pro camera for professional photographers, just like the Canon 1DX or the Nikon D5. For that, the E1X represents a more portable, rugged and lighter package. And another thing I want to demonstrate, of course, is the uh, ProRes RAW recording. Uh, that's why that I have the, uh, 
the Atomos Ninja 5 connected to the M1 X already. Uh, so I can actually show you the difference between ProRes RAW and in-camera recording. As you know that in-camera recording at the moment, all the Olympus camera, regardless of which model you have, is only 8-bit and it's only 4 to 0, whether it's going to be 1080 or, or, or 4K. And uh, even the C4K has a high bit rate, but it's still going to be 8-bit color depth. So it's not going to be great. You know, it's not it's not ineffective. It's actually quite good. Like all the videos you see in this channel were actually shot with C4K. Uh, it's plenty. It's plenty enough for most creators. I can guarantee that. But having the option of recording ProRes RAW, and that's another level. This is a really opens up the world of creativity for more high value productions um, because a lot of the uh, uh, professional studio would shoot in raw format uh, pretty much like raw in photo so you can adjust a lot of stuff like white balance uh, exposure adjustments and uh, a whole load of stuff you can do to it color grading of course you know because you have all the information that you need to manipulate for the effects that you want uh, uh, you know, in filming it's very important as well, especially like the change of colors can change the whole atmosphere for the entire film. So it's important to be able to grade your footage like properly. Um, when you're recording everything in the camera, it's always compressed and you get less latitude in terms of actual uh, color grading, let alone color corrections. So, um, so this is actually very good and I do find it very, very useful. But like I mentioned, that uh, shooting raw, pretty much like photos, um, you lose a lot of stuff. First of all, you will lose the automated uh, camera profile correction. So any distortion, vignetting, uh, uh, fringing will not be corrected. And that's why you would need a very high quality lens if you want high quality footage, because nothing will be corrected in the camera nor in any of the software. So you have to do everything yourself. Um, secondly is the noise reduction. Uh, and same thing, you know, you will have no noise reduction apply and you will find it generally in all raw format video is that anything about from 400 onward, you see loads and loads of noise. So you have to apply quite heavy uh, 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 a noise reduction in post-production to get rid of them but that's entirely up to you entirely how uh, you know up to you how to apply everything you know this is this is the the freedom that you have with the raw uh, 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 video capturing but it's <laughs> actually shouting at me at the moment um, and the third thing is sharpening same thing you know uh, the you have no camera sharpening at all, so you have to do all that in post-production. Uh, then again, it's up to you entirely how you want your footage to look like. Uh, so this is exactly what a lot of people don't understand when it comes to filming. That's why you need a lot of really high quality cine lenses or high grade lenses to capture uh, a, a very uh, good quality uh, video footage. It's what I'm talking about when you do raw recording because because you lose all those corrections and enhancement that that you normally get from in-camera recording so um, just bear that in mind you know if you don't know much about ProRes raw uh, or any raw recording in, in general uh, this is what you get so you have to do a lot more in post-production to get the footage that you want uh, but again if you're an artist like uh, uh, as you would be in a, in a photographer world uh, in a photography world like your photographer you're shooting raw photos you know how that works right you know it's, it's the flexibility that you gain from shooting raw to enable you to express yourself in the final results this is the same thing in video if you're shooting raw uh, you get all that um, but just one final note about the ProRes RAW for Olympus is that um, at current form, this is the first iterations of the uh, Olympus support for ProRes RAW. Um, more updates going to come in the future, and I can guarantee that. But at present, because this is the first version of it, um, the, uh, it doesn't support <laughs> what I would like to see in ProRes RAW is, uh, is exposure and white balance adjustments. You can change white balance just like, uh, like you would normally do with the in-camera uh, in recording, um, but at the moment it's fixed, so you can't do too much to it. So what you do gain is the colors, the information that you gain from the file. But at the moment you can't do exposure and compensation, you can't do uh, white balance adjustment properly. Uh, when that's supported, you will see a whole world change. Um, but Atomos uh, is currently working really hard with the firmware. Um, they recently just added the same support for the Nikon uh, Z series cameras. So I'm pretty sure the Olympus version will come sooner or later. Hopefully it will be very, very soon in this year. Uh, we'll see the, uh, the compatibility for exposure and white balance adjustment. That will be awesome, awesome. Um, but that's it. That's it. I think it's pretty cool. So now let's, let me demonstrate how everything works in here. And you can see the comparison between the two video formats. Uh, uh, 
and uh, both in camera and ProRes RAW. Uh, the difference is quite significant, especially you have a very high contrast scenes like a very bright light area and very dark uh, foreground or background. You will see really, really major difference there. But today, it's fairly overcast and <laughs> quite even the light to be quite honest. So hopefully I'll still be able to demonstrate something and uh, let's see what, what we're gonna do. Here is a comparison between in-camera recording using OM Log 400 Profile and the other in ProRes RAW recording, both in C4K. Can you see just how much flatter the ProRes RAW looks, which really helps to broaden the depth for highlight and shadows, resulting a scene with more details that otherwise be crushed by compression. Here's another compression with the same footage, but this time color corrected. You can see how much more details you can retrieve from ProRes RAW. In terms of quality, this brings Olympus right up there in the pro arena in terms of sheer image quality and flexibility for post-editing work. Finally, Firma 2.0 gives you improved stabilization for videos, which Olympus hasn't been very specific on what was, well, improved. I tested some footage on walking and running, but they all seem pretty much the same to me. But perhaps with a little less jello at the extreme corners when using ultra-wide lenses and you will have to study very hard to be able to tell the difference. But improvement is an improvement, and I won't complain. Remember, the E1X is a professional camera. Well, in fact, let me rephrase it. The E1X is a top-grade professional camera. Its unibody structure is definitely one of the strongest I've ever seen. I don't think anything could destroy it. Even when Olympus says that it's IPX1 sealed, I think it's more than that. Olympus was playing safe and being modest. I can definitely say that I don't have a problem using it in crazy weather or environmental conditions. Same can be said about the equally rated EM5 Mark III. Perhaps EM1 Mark III comes close, but EM1X takes the crown in terms of build and weather sealing. Period. All this translates to ultimate reliability. Not sure about you, but the amount of photos and videos I do far exceeds normal enthusiasts. I'm happy to report that since E1 Mark II, Olympus has proven me that these high-tech cameras can be reliable. Coupled with tough build I mentioned, I have a system that I can truly rely on, so I can focus on getting my job done, in the field, wherever and whenever. You may wonder, why I did not list out everything in this video? Well, like any Olympus cameras, the E1X is feature-packed. It will make this video 3 hours long. Second, I already done a preview video when this camera was announced. This long-term review is based on what I used the camera for and my experience over the past 2 years, using the E1X in all sorts of steals and video projects. So, is the E1X still the flagship of flagship? over the flagship of E1 Mark III, the question is even more blur with the 2 euro camera since its retail price has dropped significantly to the point that it's now very close to the Mark III. The truth is, they're both great cameras and each has its own unique selling point and target audience. If you're a professional who demands your camera to perform, there is little to argue that the E1X is a higher grade camera than the Mark III, purely based on build and handling. And of course, if you are one of those photographers who can make use of any of the AI subject tracking profiles, trains, cars, planes, and now birds, and those who use long lenses, then the EM1X is a much, much better choice. But for those who favor portability while maintaining pro features and build, or again, those who use the new specific features that the EM1 Mark III offers, like Starry Sky AF and Enhanced Portrait Mode, the smaller brother certainly makes more sense. In terms of Olympus video users, well, it's a question on how you use your cameras. I have both and can tell you that E1X is great and can be the beast when fully rigged out with monitors, mics and lights. I also love the size of E1 Mark III, especially when put on gimbals for cinematic sequences. Now that both of these models can export raw signals to Atomos Ninja 5 for highest quality recording, they are both, at least to my eyes, professional video cameras. With that said, I will call both E1X and E1 Mark III flagship cameras within Olympus, just aiming for different group of users. With Firma 2.0, the E1X is even better, especially for bird shooters and videographers. 
but I was left a little surprised that this update didn't include a new AF algorithm that includes the enhanced portrait mode from the E1 Mark III. It would have been perfect if it did. But since I own both cameras, I'm not complaining, but for those who only use E1X and photograph a lot of people, they may be left wondering. So that's it folks, thanks for watching and let me know your thoughts on the E1X. Do you have one or are you considering getting one? And you know what to do now, thumb if you like this video and sub if you want to support this channel and me. Peace!